Suspense. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. In spite of the sometimes discouraging evidence to the contrary, crime really doesn't pay. The chaser of the fast buck always slips upon the banana peel of retribution and ends up with his nose to the grindstone of penal servitude, if we may be permitted to mangle a metaphor. Upon this moral precept hangs a tale, which you are about to hear. Listen. Listen, then, as Jackie Cooper stars in The Amateur, which begins in just a moment. This is Frank Knight speaking for the world's most honored watch, Longines. The name Longines on the dial of a watch is an accepted symbol of excellence. Decade after decade, for almost a century, Longines watches have maintained this enviable position of leadership, winning highest honors for excellence, elegance, and accuracy in public competitions against the best of the world's watches. To wear a Longines watch marks a person of good taste and good judgment as well, for like all things of finest quality, a Longines is in the long run the most economical. Amazingly, you may own or proudly give a Longines watch for as little as $75. A Longines, the world's most honored watch, styled with distinction, cased in precious metal, promising a lifetime of faultless timekeeping. And here is a suggestion. For Mother on Mother's Day, why not a Longines watch? Your authorized Longines with no jeweler will be honored to serve you. And now, The Amateur, starring Mr. Jackie Cooper... A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. You see, me and Boots always been buddies, right, Boots? Right, Jerry. And, you know, we're always looking for an easy way to a fast buck, so when this here thing happens, well, I mean, we ain't exactly amateurs, you know. So it gives us the idea. It happened last Tuesday night. Me and Boots had been down a pool hall shooting a few, and along about 11 o'clock, we catch the bus uptown. Boots lives about 10 blocks north of me, so I'm hopping off the bus before him. I see you, Boots. Right. Take it easy, Jerry. Hey, call you tomorrow. Right. It's about a half a block from the bus stop to my castle. Nothing but a basement apartment in one of them brownstone buildings, you understand. But it's my castle. Well, I'm almost to my steps... When I see this new guy come running along the other side of the street, all of a sudden he cuts across toward me, and a car comes out of nowhere, hits the guy, and clobbers him flat against the brownstone wall, almost on my doorstep. Then it backs off, and it's out of sight before I can breathe twice. Hey, you all right, mister? Hey, fella. The guy was dead. What happened down there? A hit and run. I'll call the police. Okay. All right, stand back, everybody. Now, don't touch nothing until the law gets here. The neighborhood was turning out like it was a block party or something. I guess when a thing like this happens, you can't keep them away. Curiosity, maybe a little sympathy, I don't know. Anyway, about five minutes later, up comes the cops. Come on, move back. Now, stand back. Anybody see this happen? Yeah, I did. I saw the whole thing. Yeah, what's your name? Malloy. Jerry Malloy. You get the license number? Uh, no. Well, I mean, see, I seen this guy running down the street, and then he cuts across like he was trying to get to me or something, and his car comes along and pow. Know what kind of a car it was? Oh, a big one. A caddy, maybe. You get a look at the driver. No. And you don't know whether it was a man or a woman? Well, he goes on asking questions, and the more he asks, the less I seem to know about it. The photographs from one of the dailies arrive, and it's flashing all over the place. They even take my picture. Why, I don't know. But finally, the wagon takes the poor guy away, and the neighborhood goes back to bed. I take off, too, and I go down the steps to the castle, when right in front of my door, my foot hits something. There, lying at my feet, is this here license plate, see? Kind of beat up like. I pick it up. And sure enough, there's blood on it. In a moment, we continue with the second act of... Suspense. What are the little-known facts behind the unflattering page one headlines about Bing Crosby's boys? Who do they blame for all the criticism that's been coming their way lately? How do Bing's four sons feel about their strict toe-the-line upbringing? Are they doing anything to live their own lives successfully without benefit of their famous father? 
In May, McCall's Magazine. Get the answers to these questions in a revealing frank story about the private life problems of Bing and his boys. Also in May, McCall's, find out about the immensely powerful woman behind the throne of England, Marina, Duchess of Kent. Learn how her influence resulted in Queen Elizabeth's marriage to Philip, ended Princess Margaret's romance, prevented a great court scandal. Get exciting May McCall's on all newsstands now. And now, starring Mr. Jackie Cooper, Act Two of The Amateur. Well, there's no doubt in my mind that this here plate bounced off that car that clobbered the poor guy in the street. My first impulse is to hightail it down to the police station, turn in the evidence. But I decide to call my buddy first and tell him about all the excitement and see if he'll go with me. Boots says to stay put, he'll be right over. And you seen it all, Jerry? Yeah. The cops don't know about the license plate, huh? No, no, of course not, you dope. I found it after everybody had gone. But it was a big car, huh? A caddy, maybe? I think so. It all happened so quick. But it was a big-looking car, uh, kind of prosperous. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure of that. Did you get a look at the driver? Look, Boots, the cops already asked me all that. Come on, let's go. Oh, wait a minute, Jerry. I got an idea. Like what? Well, I've been thinking about it since you called me. We might be able to promote ourselves a little dough. Dough? Big car, rich man, maybe. Rich enough to want to buy his way out of a hit-and-run rap. You mean blackmail a guy? No, no, not blackmail. Just a sale. We got something he'd be mighty glad to have. We sell it to him. Deal's closed. I don't know. This is evidence. We ought to take it to the cops. If he's just rich, this ought to be worth a couple of grand to him. If he's important, oh, maybe ten. uh... It's blood money in a way, kind of. But if he's important and rich, who knows? We might be set to spend the winter in Florida, Jerry. Get us a couple of dolls. But, Boots, listen. Then we'll spend the summer in Europe. Them French babes. Ooh, la, la. Uh, how are we going to find out who he is? Trace the plate. Now, only the cops can do that. I got a friend, Andy. He can find out for us. Suppose he gets suspicious. No, not Andy. Look, let me handle it, huh? Don't go to the cops till we have a chance to see if it works, okay? Well, okay. We're going to be up there, Jerry. Them little jobs we pulled from time to time, peanuts compared to this. Yeah, but they were safe. You want to be an amateur all your life? This will make a pro out of you. Set us up for a good long time. Well, okay. That's the boy. I'll drop around the garage tomorrow after I talk to Andy, okay? Yeah, yeah, okay. Morning comes and I take off for work at the garage in 85th Street. I'm on my way to the bus when I pass the newsstand at the corner. And there I am, staring right back at myself from the morning papers. Right on the front page. My picture. I buy a couple of papers and hop the bus downtown. I'm shaking with excitement. Me on the front page. There's the story about the guy being clobbered in front of my place. Unidentified victim, the paper says. But they got me pictured for being the eyewitness. First to arrive on death scene, it says. And then it goes on about me seeing it and where I live, where I work and all. I don't even remember telling them all that. But, boy, the picture sure came out good. Well, I get to the garage, and I'm a celebrity. All the guys have seen a paper, and the boss says it's a thousand bucks worth of advertising for the garage, and he tells me to take the day off. So I'm just about to leave and go see Boots when there's a call for me. So I take it in the office, and it's this guy. Hello, Mr. Malloy. Yeah? I read in the paper this morning that you witnessed the uh, tragedy on 110th Street last night. Who are you, a reporter? <laughs> no, but you might give me some information. I told the cops all I know, which was a munch. The paper says you were the first to reach the victim. Yeah, that's right. And it happened right in front of your apartment? Hey, what is this? I'll come right to the point, Mr. Malloy. I was wondering if, um, well, if you might have found something. What do you mean? Something I might be interested in having back. Oh? Did you find something? Maybe. Uh, you know it's missing, huh? Yes. I'll be willing to pay. Well... Then you do have it. Maybe. Where can I meet you? Well, I, I got the day off. I'll pick you up any place you say. Make it one o'clock. Corner of Broadway and 96th. I'll be there. I'll be driving a dark green Cadillac. Okay. One o'clock. I'll recognize you from the paper. Well, things was happening even faster than we could have planned. I wanted to give myself time to see Boots and talk it over with him. It's great. 
Great. Right in our laps. Maybe. Now, don't take the plate with you. Talk terms first. Size him up. Yeah. Yeah, he sounded kind of educated. Or high class like. Yeah, he's probably a millionaire and scared silly about a hidden run ramp. Now, play it cagey. You got him right in the palm of your hand. Remember, he looked you up so he's scared. You can make your own deal. Yeah. I'll wait for you down the pool hall. Okay. Okay, I'll see you there as soon as I'm finished. Quarter to one, I'm waiting on a corner in 96th and Broadway. About five minutes to one, a big green caddy drives around a corner and goes on down Broadway. I'm wondering if that can be the guy when, sure enough, comes around a block again, stops, and a well-dressed guy at the wheel opens the door. Mr. Malloy? Yeah. Get in. I wanted to be sure it was you before I stopped. Uh, it's me. What's your name? Edward Keller. Uh, we'll take Riverside Drive. The traffic's light, and I prefer to keep my mind on business rather than traffic. Okay, by me. He's not a bad-looking guy. About 45, maybe. Dressed to the teeth. And, and sort of a uh, high-class look about him. I feel sort of shabby next to him in spite of I'm wearing my best suit. But I got the upper hand no matter what. While we hit Riverside Drive, the traffic thins out, and he looks over at me. I took a long chance. You might have found what I want. <laughs> kind of coincidental, ain't it? Quite. I may as well be frank, Malloy. If the police had found that, it could have put me in a very serious position. You're telling me. But as it turned out, you found it and kept your mouth shut. I'm willing to pay for that service and for your silence afterwards, of course. Sure. Package deal. Package deal. I, uh, I'm wondering, though, how, how come you thought I had it? You were the first one to reach the victim. Yeah. And the newspaper story made no mention of the police finding it. Fat chance. Landed right in front of my door. It's almost incredible. I don't know. You hit him pretty hard. I what? You really clobbered that guy. I mean, it's a wonder you didn't lose a fender, too. What are you talking about? The accident. Your license plate. You're not making sense. Well, who are you? You trying to back down or something? I don't know what your dodge is, Malloy, but don't... Now, listen, I ain't dodging. You are. You want to buy back your license plate or don't you? I'm not interested in any license plate. I want that $100,000 worth of heroin the man was carrying. We continue with the third act of Suspense. Sociable, up-to-date, debonair. What's this, a new word game? No, I'm just mentioning the qualities that people admire in other people. Oh, I see. If you're sociable, up-to-date, and uh, what was that other word, debonair? Yes, debonair. But listen to it this way. <laughs> Notice how many of your friends are serving Pepsi-Cola these days. It's the up-to-date refreshment. Be sociable. Serve Pepsi. And now, starring Mr. Jackie Cooper, Act Three of The Amateur. I'm sitting there like I'm turned to stone or something. Heroin. This caper was getting too hot for me. He pulls up to the curb and stops the car. All right, Malloy. We can cut out the cat and mouse routine. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me you ain't the guy driving that car last night? I'll ask the questions. But I thought I'm you... not interested in what you thought. I want that packet. Will you listen to me for a minute? I don't know nothing about no H or packet or nothing. Malloy, the man who was killed was purchasing that heroin for me. He was carrying it when he was run down. This I know nothing about. The police didn't report finding anything on him, and you know as well as I they would have. Now it adds up, doesn't it? No heroin on Jackie? You the first to reach him? I didn't touch the guy, I swear. You led me to believe on the phone you had it. On my mother's grave, I don't know nothing about it. I found a license plate, a beat-up plate I figured came from the car that hit him. I thought you was the driver and wanted to get the plate back to save your skin from a hit and run rap. That's quite a story. Look, look, if I had this stuff, don't you think I'd be bargaining with you right this minute? Would I be making up a story about a license plate? Wouldn't I be naming my price for the stuff? Huh? Wouldn't I? Well, 
Maybe you would at that. <laughs> and now you're looking at the situation from the right angle. If the police didn't find the stuff, and if you're telling the truth, it means Jackie wasn't carrying it. Sure, sure, that's it. And if he wasn't carrying it, he never got it. Well, I, I got an appointment, I just remembered. I'll catch the subway downtown. Sit still. <laughs> no, no, I, I can get back, okay? You'll get back when I'm ready to take you. We start back uptown. This guy's really sore. But not at me. That I'm sure of. When we get to 106th Street, he pulls up in front of an apartment and stops. We're only four blocks from my place. He gets out and motions me to go ahead of him. We walk up the steps to a foyer. He rings a bell in a sort of rhythm, like a code or something. And after a couple of seconds, a buzzer opens the door. Well, we take an elevator to the third floor. And when the door is open, he steps out into a little hall with one door in it. Keller goes through the same ring a bit, and the door opens a crack. What do you want, Keller? I want to see Giacomo. He's not here. I'll wait. Who is this punk? Never mind. Look, come back later, huh? Come on in, Keller. Take off, Pete. The room's dark. Not pitch dark, but gloomy, kind of. The voice comes from a big, fat guy sitting behind the biggest desk I ever seen. Sorry about Jackie, Keller. I'll bet you are. Who's this? The man who saw Jackie get hit. Oh, bringing him here wasn't very wise. I want to get something cleared up. Indeed. What did you pull on me last night? I don't think I like your tone, Keller. What do you mean? Jackie didn't have the stuff or the money on him when they scraped him off the sidewalk. Oh? How do you explain that? Why ask me? Because I think Jackie gave you the money, but you didn't give him the heroin. Oh, really, Keller? What do you take me for? Jackie never showed up last night. What? I was expecting him. As a matter of fact, I inconvenienced myself waiting for him. Then this morning, we read of his demise. I presume he was on his way here when he was hit. And why didn't he have the money? One hundred thousand dollars in cash. The papers would surely have latched onto that. Why don't you ask your friend here? Wasn't he the first to reach check in? Now, wait I'm a really minute. annoyed with you, Keller. We've been dealing with each other for years, and you let a punk like this pull the wool over your eyes. You come in here accusing me now, Take of... it easy, John. I don't know nothing about any hundred thousand bucks. Let me handle this, Keller. If he's got the money, I'll find out my own way. I'm afraid not. It's become my concern now. What do you mean? I mean I can't have a punk like this knowing about my operations here. Take him down to the garage. We'll find out what he did with your money during the ride. Ride? Hey, hey, you guys kidding or something? Wait a minute, Giacomo. I'm not so sure that's the right way. It is the only way. I have to protect my interests. And yours as well. If you know what I mean. Use this private elevator. I'll meet you in the garage. All right, Giacomo. But if anything happens before I get that money... You have nothing to worry about, Keller. Nothing at all. Get going. Well, I don't mind saying now, I was scared out of my Sunday pants. I didn't have to ask any more questions to know what these birds were up to. These were the real pros. <laughs> and I knew this Giacomo guy was playing for keeps. Well, the elevator glides to a stop and out we get. The doors close and it goes back up again. I see we're in a small garage with two big jobs parked facing the doors. And then it hits me. I'm seeing a familiar-looking license plate on the rear of the black caddy. Maybe this is my chance. Over there, Malloy, and keep quiet. Now, Keller, you, you got to listen to Shut me. Shut up. Now, listen. That's the car. The black cad there on the left. That's the one. The one what? That's the car I seen run down that pal of yours. What? Believe me. Believe me. I know that license number. And I give you ten to one odd the front plate's gone. You see, it ain't there. Because at this minute, it's behind the bottom drawer of my dresser. Don't you see? I've been leveling with you. Yes. I'm beginning to see a lot of things. This schmo Giacomo rode down your pal with his own car. Look at him dents in a bumper. Uh-oh. Keep out of the way, Malloy. I've got a little matter to take up with Giacomo. But watch out. He's got his goon with him. Well, Keller, why aren't you in the car? Which one, Giacomo? The one you murdered Jackie with? Boss? No. <laughs> no, the other one. Or perhaps you'd like to run for it. As Jackie did. Oh, no, Giacomo. You can take the punks for rides and squash the flunkies on the sidewalk, but you don't push me over. 
I am eliminating my middleman, Keller. You're eliminating nothing. I want that hundred thousand. You won't be needing it. What are you... I've decided not to sell to you anymore. And the nature of our business makes a permanent termination necessary. I think you know what I mean. You fat pig. Get in that car. You fat rat, you meat. Then all three of them were in a heap on the floor, and I was in the caddy starting the motor. I stepped on the gas, and I went through them garage doors like a dog through a hook. And then... Well, you guessed it. I run smack into a police car. And I'm never so glad to see cops in all my life. Well, they go in and clean up Giacomo and his playmates. But if you don't think I had some explaining to them, they had me tied up with them ghouls. So I have to get them to take me home where I give them the license plate and tell them the whole story. I get a hold of Boots, and like the buddy he is, he backs me up. But we have to spill the whole thing to the cops to get ourselves out of being connected with the dope pushers. Right, Boots? Right, Jerry. So, they're holding us for intent to blackmail, withholding evidence, and I don't know what all. But the mouthpiece says we'll probably get off easy since we made a clean breast of it and helped catch them harpies. Hey, by the way, Mac, what are you in for? Suspense. In which Jackie Cooper starred in William N. Robeson's production of The Amateur. Written by Robert Jurin. In a moment... The names of our supporting players and a word about next week's story of suspense. A young lady by the name of Scheherazade kept her audience of one enthralled for a thousand and one nights with one of the longest stories in history. That's a long time to devote to one chronicle, but some of CBS Radio's winning seven weekday dramas have put that record in the shade. Entertaining audiences in the millions with many times a thousand and one days of continuing dramatic serials. Each weekday on the CBS Radio Network, there's a wealth of daytime drama, including such outstanding serials as The Romance of Helen Trent, The Couple Next Door, Ma Perkins, Whispering Streets, The Right to Happiness, The Second Mrs. Burton, and Young Dr. Malone. Monday through Friday, follow these absorbing true-to-life stories. Only CBS Radio brings you the winning seven combination of top daytime dramas. Another important reason for the different sound of this CBS radio station. Supporting Jackie Cooper in the amateur were Tommy Cook, Peter Leeds, Barry Kroger, and Norm Alden. Listen. Listen again next week when we return with Ida Lupino and Howard Duff starring in On a Country Road. Another tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. <laughs> 